Good afternoon. Um, first, a very sincere thanks to Sharjah Art Foundation for inviting me and us. Second, I want to start with a parable. In Western India, there are a number of unusual temples dedicated to gods called Jaks. In the 1990s, the custodian of one of these temples told me that the Jaks were Hindu deities who emerged from the sea to save the people from an evil force. Later, I learned from books in the Asiatic Society in Mumbai and in libraries in London that this story had not always been so. Speculation in the library literature on the origin of these fair-skinned foreigners attributes them to Anatolia or Syria or to Greece or to Turkey and sometimes to Central Asia. Speaking perhaps of a submerged superstructure of historical connections or perhaps of an Orientalist fantasy. In India, their story seems to have been first written down by the British colonialists in the 1820s. The same story is repeated in the 1830s and again in the 1880s by different authors. These authors tell of how the Jucks were shipwrecked and made their way inland on horseback to save the locals from the depredations of either a king or a demon. They brought with them on their horsebacks peace and a great knowledge of medicine. The story is repeated again in the 1920s and 1930s by different authors. By the 1950s, the Jucks, with 71 brothers and a sister, they still came from Damascus. They seated themselves on a hill. The hill, however, unable to sustain so much purity, began to sink. And so the Jucks moved from hill to hill from the same necessity, just as they had done in the 1820 version of the story. A different author presented the story in 1961, which became the basis of a well-known art historian's rendition, which in turn became the principal source for a presidential address to the Conference of the American Association of Asian Studies in Boston in 1999. So to sum up so far, the English and Gujarati print versions of the tale of the Jucks is largely self-referential and draws on no external evidence from the wilds of living culture for nearly two centuries. The story is frozen in time, or at least in print. In Boston, in 1999, the Juk myth was presented as an inversion history. Muslims, in, Muslims as invaders appear as the heroes and the natives as the villains. Furthermore, it's argued that it was probably in the interests of the early colonial British to nurture this myth, for it strengthened their own colonial interests as a precedent for invasion to convey prestige and liberation. So in this sense, the myth of the Jucks speaks of the assimilation of the values of the conquerors by natives. Invasion becomes liberation and prestige. Today, however, the origin myth of the Jucks, as told by the custodians of the temple, the myth in the wild, so to speak, has no resemblance whatsoever to the version I have just dutifully traced through the literature from India in the 1820s to Boston in 1999. Recently, I visited again the temple. The Jucks had become this magnificent and haunting site, more so than in the 1990s. They'd been painted, they'd been dressed in regal cloth turbans and bedecked with jewels and garlands. The horses were now a fine, luminous blue-white. They were surrounded by deities from the Hindu pantheon and symbols of Om and swastika. Loudspeakers issued words of devotion to Lord Shiva. And as I listened to those words, I was told not how the Jucks emerged from the sea, not from the ocean, as I'd been told in the 1990s, but how they'd fallen to earth from Lord Shiva's hair. The Jucks, then, are no longer immigrants. They've been drawn firmly into the local traditions of Hinduism. Their story shows the hegemony of the written over what is not. 
For the literate, writing is often seductive. Writing is easily reproduced as writing. What is not written is much harder to put in words. In the parable of the Jux, we also have the reverberation of colonial ways of seeing into the religious traditions of post-colonial India. History, we also see, is largely plagiarized. What historical truths do the texts I've mentioned actually represent, especially when they have such a clear genealogy? What other ideas and tales that have become writing have been propelled through time from that period, primarily because they were written down? At one level, we have laws, regulations. At another, we have the separation and distinction of languages. We have nations, oceans, cultures. At another still, we have ways of thinking, doing, and believing. In another sense, the myth and its transformations point to the problematic relationship between the land and the sea, and how things from the sea may endlessly trouble or challenge those on land. This, then, is the parable of the Jux, and I'll be back later. So to turn around and go briefly in the, dire in the opposite direction um, from the question of what of the sea could be assimilated into a land-based meaning would be to ask perhaps what kinds of things, qualities, effects have and do radiate out from one coastline with some momentum or some desires enough that they reach another faraway shore. Or put a little differently, what if small ports in Gujarat and Iran and Somalia and places like Elman on the Somali coast, which is not even a port, a kind of beach, but that nevertheless acts as a port for an entire kind of district, and the boats that ply um, in these places were to be rendered in a kind of painting as small suns, and sons is S-U-N-S, not um, my son, uh, as radiating possibilities and capacities and needs and expressions in all directions. I'm trying to draw an image, a very different image from the one that we have been of transport and of exchange that we have become used to in a kind of networked era. A very different image from the more kind of technological um, metaphor of railway connections and airline routes and road maps, of point-to-point -point connections that have their roots in a kind of military cybernetics of control of specific guns. So this, which is a Kachi painting of uh, an unknown era by an unknown person, but from the sailing age, is, uh, that's what you see, uh, but my image uh, would also be something that does not totally obscure the, as I think kind of network diagrams tend to do, would not totally obscure the requirements and the, and the presence of energies and the work required to keep up one's own little sons, so to speak. So, I'm talking about our project uh, by the way of something that happened in 2009. Uh, the quote you see here is from a Brecht essay uh, whose English title was The Radio as an Apparatus of Communication. It's from 1932. And we are talking about radio here because in 2009, our first engagement with Sharjah Creek as artists took the shape of a publication and a series of radio transmissions from a boat on the creek um, where we were radiating uh, through a kind of high-powered FM setup to an approximately five to seven kilometers radius, um, kind of creating a new kind of space, not a network space, but, a, but something else, uh, a bit like a star. The radio is 
criticism of radio uh, that Brecht does here, I think, was obviously right in a major sense that it was about, it was right in the sense that it talked about the democratizing possibility of speaking as well as hearing. But I think was off in a couple of other senses and I want to, and this drove um, us in our um, deployment of it. One is that radio is exactly not a network of pipes, as he says, I think, in the sixth sentence. And I don't know why he used that. I think maybe he had a kind of subconscious memory of Soviet-style wired radio, which was radio piped to your house. Um, literally radio without radio, the possibility of radio. Uh, I'm not sure uh, why, why he used that very strange metaphor, because radio is exactly not like pipes. And the other thing, perhaps, is that this, the feedback loop, the, the way of listening, the necessity to listen and transmit in the same circuit we have found since then is perhaps not as liberating as we had thought earlier. And we were more interested in parasitism, in ideas of, the, of how you describe so-called networks as actually great leaps across domains. Uh, very unlikely leaps rather than the, the containment of a domain or the creation of a domain. So this is an image from 2009 from a rooftop near the museum where people could listen to the radio transmissions from the boat which is about a kilometer away. Um, one of many listening posts, the book is there as well, which was an account of um, every material entity that was shipped to Somalia from Sharjah port that year and everything that came back. But what's interesting is that there is a person pointing um, kind of impossibly, impossibly to the location of the radio station. So these were two things that radio did for us in a way. It opened us a space that didn't exist previously. It cut across many boundaries disregarding property, propriety, divisions that existed obviously on the port and in what has now become the heritage area. Uh, and at the same time, it was not exactly not a conversation. It was deeply one way. It was not, uh, there was no sense in which anybody was talking back to a radio station like no one can talk back to the sun. So this um, directional nature or its possibility in the world of communication and the tyrannies of feedback that we, and control systems that we are more familiar with now was a sense of possibility. And I think in a very different way and in a different world, um, we are thinking through about this possibility with both in our, um, as the medium of our new work. So to rethink movement as a vector form, as not movements in general, and to be able to think of each transmission as unique and not expecting a reply. We are trying to re-describe what is usually described as communication, trade, exchange, um, explained away in these kind of, in these ways, as actually something much more directed, parasitic, sucking, or dependent, supportive, outward facing, and many dimensions of this. And so this is a way in which I think we could sense better the movements directly to Somalia, right? Where the word food program refuses to go, where the change in direction from something passing by um, the seas to something going to Somalia made a crucial difference or completely changed its relationship to piracy, for example. So the boats were directly passing through the pirates on a daily basis, which is one of the other things that attracted this to us. And this is also a sense of kind of orientation or redirecting our interests, um, in which uh, it's also the sense of kind of outwardness in which small boats are still made as family enterprises in small towns in Gujarat and in Iran and elsewhere, which are built kind of looking outward. And it's also the reason why, and it's kind of, uh, kind of orientation, which is the reason why 
uh, the sailors that we worked with have much more often been to Dubai and Sharjah than to Ahmedabad, the capital of Gujarat. We know that mapping, cartography, can be a form of translation or representation. Color, shade, infill, cross-hatching, and symbols can denote things, people, and other stuff. We can sub subvert conventions. We can ignore the invention of longitude, and if you forgive the pun, we can approach with latitude the weight we give to the points of the compass. We can calibrate scale against qualities other than size. Cartography is an epistemology, or how we know things. The journeys of these ships pass through different kinds of cartography, through the changing contours of history and relations between the world of fluidity and movement and another world, the same world actually, in which things are static and form a relatively fixed series of beacons of meaning. These ships might encourage the observer to think about what is generally known. But often, I'm afraid, what is generally known has already been written down, so is therefore difficult to subvert. Where are we? We're not in Sarja now, but we're in the seemingly unpronounceable Gulf of Kutch, a gash of brine-soaked tidal mud in the side of Western India. It's a part of the modern state of Gujarat. It's the gulf in the center of this map, part of the diamond of India, which borders both Pakistan and the Indian Ocean. It's also home to the Jaks. The shores of the Gulf are littered with the filthy industries of India's new prosperity. It is here, as elsewhere, that the spinning, forging, molding, electrolyzing, smelting, and melting of India's industrial manufacturing takes place. This is the dirty end of India's shining. In amid all of this, men make wooden ships. The wooden ships that you can see on the opposite shore of the creek outside this venue. A goat is killed. At the point on the land reached by the highest tides, the keel is laid out in blocks. The most skilled craftsmen do not require diagrams or plans to build these ships. They have embodied the knowledge. They know what they're doing, mostly. They have refined their eyes for proportion and the relative strength of materials. Around them, teams of men work at shaping the ribs of the vessel, while others drill and bolt hull and decking planking. Most of this work is done by hand. For others, of course, building a ship may involve nothing more than being beaten and making 4,000 cups of tea. Later, the seams are corked, and anti-foul and oil is applied to where the timber remains naked. The vessel is floated and towed to Dubai, where it's fitted with motors and electronics. Along with the construction of the ship, crews are produced through labor, brutality, and discipline. This sensible, sensible arrangement equips the sailor with an appreciation of the construction of the vessel on which his life depends at sea. Once complete, the ship and the crew migrate under diesel power. The sails have long gone. The folklore and indigenous knowledge of the sea stars and sirens is formed by ship-to-shore radio, GPS, and SMS. Later, their trade routes from Gujarat bring them into the creek at Sharjah on their way to other ports. It's in vain that we attempt to say what we see. There can be no ship-shaped ship 
in my speech. It's also in vain that we attempt to show with images, in a certain sense, what we are saying. The places where the hulking handmade ships achieve their splendor are in our eyes and in the sensations of our body. Technology such as this has enchantment, it has powers of its own. What is built on the shoreline possesses qualities quite aside from robust water tightness, because these ships carry magic. The vessels confront our ideas of craftsmanship and scale. They appear too big to be handmade and too old to be modern. They ask questions of our place in time and space. Wooden ships and hand tools in the hyper-industrial and hyper-global space of the Gulf of Kutch. Wooden ships and cheap cargoes in the Sharjah Creek. What assumptions of yours about progress, civilization, and the conceit of nations does the wooden ship call to question? I shall be back once more. So how to face Somaliland, for example, in the sense of the encounter described by many, uh, the Levinasian encounter <clears throat> that allows us to have a relationship to recognize the stranger. Um, a clip, a few clips of uh, continuing in the direction um, that I described earlier. Boats going to Bandarabas, uh, cars, huge cars going to Bandarabas. And daily goods arriving in Bosaso and Pantland, which is uh, northern Somalia. Goats going to Salala. And returning to Somalia again, except to a part of Somalia that calls itself independent, uh, Somaliland and the port of Berber. Again, carrying, carrying toothbrushes, dentist chairs, children's clothes, pasta, coffee, hospital equipment, you name it. Uh, it's the only supply chain of daily goods into Somalia by sea. Charcoal carried from southern Somalia, Kismayo in this case, back to Sharjah. A reason for much um, regulation, anxiety, attempts to control the export. Used tires from Musket to Karachi. A sailor from Kutch. And a boat returning completely empty to Jamsalaya in Kutch. 
How much time do we have left, Claudia? Five minutes. Okay. Uh, the work, the the work we did uh, went this way because the face-to-face -face encounter is, as we all know, increasingly impossible, or only one of many, many, many other kinds of encounters from wood, I mean, from ships approaching different legal regimes, from encounters between Iranian diesel and Chinese engines and wooden boats, or encounters between sailors and new immigration laws, or boats and no laws at all, as is sometimes the case in, in Somalia. So in order to start to enter this world, we, we realized that one would have, have to pass through or approach, since we have no uh, kind of sense organs as artists somehow to, to sense diesel directly, right? We have to invent forms of understanding what it means and what effects it could have. We have to pass through a range of mediators. And in this case, uh, the mediators were sailors and a kind of medium of self-expression that they had started to, in the last five years, develop. Uh, and our work, the film that you uh, can see every, every night at 8.30 p.m. Um, is uh, kind of was inspired by this. And these were uh, videos taken on a cell phone, often or on small cameras, recording daily events, landings, uh, ports, port scenes, and things back home when uh, the sailors would return in the monsoons. So the sailor as a kind of agent and the boat as a kind of agent that is not consumed, that is not eaten in the relationship of consumption that connects many of these places and is kind of shelterer or carrier of it became our uh, medium as well. And a funny, obviously, um, part of this is that um, sailors, the professional ethic of a sailor is to not eat their cargo, right? I mean, that wouldn't work. So there's a kind of uh, relationship, an indirect relationship to the trade and to the kinds of consumption that we are describing that we had to enter in order to begin to describe um, what was happening. And what we saw in those videos which inspired the film showed us how every trip became its own kind of distinct entity. And in, in that sense, what we imagined was that every boat among the hundreds and perhaps thousands of boats, at least a thousand in, 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 from Gujarat, was changing in its own way the space we call the Indian Ocean. This is the final leg. We're perhaps slightly behind our schedule. <clears throat> we have the jucks, we have radio waves, we have carpenters who've not written anything down, we have churning journeys into ports. In this story, we have the view from the other boat, not the NATO patrol vessel, not CNN, not the moorings of the nation state, or the straightforward march of progress. Instead, we have a variety of messages conveyed by a somewhat creaky medium. However, from the shores of the Western Indian Ocean, there is a myopia towards life in the churning ships, the ones we've just heard and seen. Whatever these ships represent, it is not part of the post-colonial heritage impulse found in many nation states in the region. In this impulse, there is a yearning for the Latin rig for extinct vessel types, and for a glorious and more innocent past that has given way to bad modern things. <clears throat> 
We want to end by looking at the work of one pioneering nostalgic, whose endeavours preempt a broader nostalgic impulse in the littoral countries of the Western Indian Ocean. We shall call him Mr F, a curator of sorts, rather like the Austri Austrian farmer we heard about yesterday. Today, Mr F and his collaborators, who sailed and prospered in the good old days of empire, shout, the Tao is dead, as their mansions slowly fade. Along a wharf in the Gulf of Kutch, colonnades of port buildings mark authoritative and regular intervals along the shore. Clean vertical lines, architectural perfection, circles on top of golden rectangles, classical proportions, which for the sailor must have appeared striking after a voyage amid horizontal horizons. Here they are. These buildings housed passengers resting on their journey between unpronounceable Kutch and elsewhere. In time, the passengers stopped coming, but the buildings remained. What repeated earthquakes had not managed to break, nostalgia for the past has. Mr. F got there before UNESCO. With the application of concrete and iron, one of the rest houses has been reorientated to represent a ship underway. In the absence of a real ship, Mr. F has turned his building into a ship. And this is happening all around the Western Indian Ocean, often on a much grander scale. Now, from the rooftop terrace, a man can imagine himself on the bridge of a ship looking down over a cargo hold, beyond the peak of the stern and out across the waves of the immediate future. Only this ship is on land, not on water. The ship, like the Jux, has moved from land to sea as power has been reoriented. Inside the ship on land, a small group of men make model ships from pieces of wood. Here they are. They lovingly recreate the shape and form of vessels no longer found in the waters of the Indian Ocean. Ships within ships. Alongside their miniature productions is a concern with pre pre preserving the past through tales of adventure and maritime bravery. Stuck in the repetition of a small number of stories and repeatedly remodeling the curves of a hull, nostalgia has become the impossible desire for its own absence. The nostalgic seeks a quieter self, and therefore, in a sense, is searching for a time when nostalgia was itself absent. The nostalgic attempts to place themselves in a time when the burden of hindsight was not so heavy, when there was no awareness of what it was that they would later yearn for. Nostalgia is generally thought to emerge at the critical juncture of historical loss and the dissipation of moral certainties in changing and aging worlds. In this case, a new Muslim mercantile diaspora has risen to dominate the industry of shipping. The Hindu captain of the ships within ships on land structure is steering a course across the estuary towards the bold green and white homes of new Muslim seafarers. Perhaps he imagines he'll be able to run them down. In his path, at sixes and sevens, lie the new fleet of motorized sailing vessels. Here they are. The mud is full of ship life. Why should nostalgia for the past flourish when there are so many ships in the present? The myopia of the nostalgic towards this motorized sailing vessel is striking. The death of the Tao is mourned by Mr. F's modest maritime museum, while at the same time, a fleet of wooden vessels prepare for the sailing season in full view of his funeral entourage. And we both thank you for your time and patience.